let's start the class so i'm going to talk about the topic known as shock very very important concept in the field of medicine now right now we are talking about the surgical topics but please consider it as one of the most important topic for you because once you uh, you know make a concept on shock you can handle this very easily in the hospital please mute yourself all of you now the term shock is one of the emergency situation whenever we hear this term when while uh, you know having practice in the hospital or working in the hospital we run towards the patient we want to you know bring that patient back to the normal level, uh, normal as soon as possible so always treat shock like this okay now let's start shock is defined as inadequate delivery of oxygen and substrate or nutrients to maintain the normal tissue and cellular function so this is shock so there is a, a imbalance between demand and supply so there is a severe imbalance between demand and supply now what i am talking here for example what is the purpose of blood flow that blood is carrying certain important substance like oxygen and glucose that oxygen and glucose should be delivered to the tissues to have the normal function if that cannot happen then the condition is known as shock shock becomes irreversible if not treated early there are different classifications of shock okay we'll we'll uh, talk about them one after other one of the classification is known as compensated and decompensated shock now compensated means reversible and decompensated means probably probably it is already irreversible though it may not be applicable in 100% of the time some of the patient may may come back again you know with a good treatment but majority of them you know they they die because of different complication so shock becomes reversible if not treated early remember one very very important you know sentence whenever your teacher asks a definition of shock insufficient perfusion of tissues and cells most of the time it is associated with low cardiac output but not always now shock is more than just tachycardia and hypotension it is much more than that but these are the common clinical features tachycardia and hypotension we often see confusion ke in the patient because of why confusion occurs can anybody tell me why yes because let this because of low nutrition supply of oxygen and brain cerebrum sir very good excellent every student answering in the same way this is because of hypoxia to the brain decrease oxygenation of the brain decrease blood flow to the brain decrease supply of glucose to the brain all of these things are happening in shock so patient will be confused regarding the kidney okay there is acute renal failure occurs now there are different types of acute renal failure so let me analyze this right now okay i'll go very slowly in this class because this is very very important one for you Let's see here in the beginning this is known as pre renal failure pre renal okay pre renal failure whenever there is decreased blood flow towards the kidney okay kidneys are normal at, at till this time but they are not getting enough perfusion this is known as pre renal failure if we treat the patient early then they cannot go into intrinsic renal failure but if treatment is not provided in time then they will definitely develop renal failure itself this is also known as intrinsic renal failure okay and another term for this is atn acute tubular necrosis so in all of this situation there is increased blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine 
they are high in the blood these are the features of abnormal kidney function liver in liver okay, i like to highlight a little bit about this also okay one one important point once once again to you if you take the ratio of bun and creatinine if it is if this ratio is more than 20 if this ratio is more than 20 it is highly suggestive of prerenal failure because in prerenal failure the bun is much more increased than creatinine whereas if this ratio is less than 20 for, for example somewhere around 10 to 15 this is highly suggestive of intrinsic type of renal failure or atm i will talk about this in the coming classes now let's move on another uh, important uh, you know uh, organ which is affected here is liver now in liver okay there will be abnormal liver function test and that is known by elevated ast and alt tell me the full, full form of ast and alt yes what's the full form sir as parted amino transfer is ast sir and ld level transfer is sir alt very good excellent i'm sure many other students know this also ast aspartate amino transferase or you can simply call it aspartate transaminase as well and alt alanine al is for alanine amino transferase or transaminase as aspartate al alanine transaminase or amino transferase now uh, in some of the textbook okay it is also mentioned with another name now, ast is also known as sgot and alt is known as sgpt sgot and sgpt now sgot means serum glutamate oxaloacetate transferase and serum glutamate pyruvate transaminase or transferase whatever you want to say okay so these are some other name of ast and alt now they are usually higher if liver is uh, you know affected because of shock and why liver is affected the answer is still the same because there is decreased perfusion of the liver liver is not getting enough blood supply as a result of that there is damage of the liver bilirubin can also be high okay serum bilirubin can also be high but these enzymes are much more sensitive than bilirubin regarding the heart or cardiovascular system there would be chest pain and shortness of the breath this occurs because of heart failure okay this occurs because of heart failure mainly and in the hematology or blood there will be collection of increased lactic acid now before the break i explain very nicely about the mechanism of this lactic acid so let's uh, you know repeat it once again now this is decreased tissue perfusion what i am talking here okay decreased tissue perfusion whenever there is decreased tissue perfusion there is decreased oxygenation okay decreased oxygenation this decreased oxygenation leads to anaerobic metabolism anaerobic metabolism and the end product of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid so this is how you correlate the things so don't be surprised at the end if all of those shock different type of shock would develop metabolic acidosis this is the mechanism there let's move further now let's proceed now what is the pathophysiology and different types of shock now, shock is a state of imbalance between the supply and demand i already uh, you know mentioned this important sentence it's a clear cut state of imbalance the cells okay are showing different demand sorry increased demand but the tissues are having increased demand but there is clear cut decreased supply 
as a result of decreased perfusion that is shock now we are doctor and medical students so how to determine this tissue perfusion okay now let's talk about some of the formula here there are some important terms like cardiac output stroke volume heart rate systemic vascular resistance okay now let's talk about it cardiac output is equivalent to stroke volume multiplied by heart rate every one of us know that okay every one of us know now cardiac output is equivalent to stroke volume multiplied by heart rate now let's talk about the blood pressure it is, it is very you know nicely correlated with this other blood pressure is equivalent to cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance or svr also known as peripheral vascular resistance for that sake so these are the same thing cardiac output multiply by systemic vascular resistance if cardiac output is increase okay blood pressure is increase if systemic vascular resistance is increase blood pressure is again increase so similarly if cardiac output is decrease there is hypotension or fall in blood pressure if systemic blood vessels are dilated means if there is decreased resistance in them then also blood pressure will fall never forget this wonderful formula you can easily answer if this type of question is asked now how to calculate the systemic vascular resistance or peripheral vascular resistance this is done by calculating the mean arterial pressure okay we subtract central venous pressure which should be measured okay divided by cardiac output now there is a one new term for you mean arterial pressure now what is mean arterial pressure anybody know they can answer now sir it's about 67 mm of mercury okay i'll come to you okay anybody else mean mean arterial yes, pressure pressure uh, in uh, aorta which is 93 mm per hg it's a basically driving force in a patient artery during one cardiac cycle it's a basically driving force that run from the artery side to the venous side okay sir it is sir it should indicate the perfusion to white blood organ sir fine fine now everybody yes yes, yes please yeah yeah go on yes yes it's difference between the diastolic and systolic pressure okay now see that there are different answers i'm getting from the students okay because the question is related this is the average uh, blood pressure during single cardiac cycle okay now see here very good the concept is there okay so today i am going to teach you about how to calculate it the concept is there you are right the mean arterial pressure is the mean pressure which drives the blood flow inside the blood vessel especially inside the artery that's what we are talking and the same pressure will push the blood into the capillary and drive that blood towards the vein as well you are absolutely right but how to calculate it so let's talk about it Let's see here. This is mean arterial pressure. I'm talking now. MAP mean arterial pressure is equal to diastolic blood pressure. Okay, plus one third of pulse pressure. Never forget this. Diastolic blood pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. Now another term has come. Pulse pressure. PP is pulse pressure. Okay. so let me write the full form here pulse pressure now what is this pulse pressure pulse pressure is the difference between systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure so systolic minus diastolic blood pressure is equivalent to pulse pressure and diastolic blood pressure plus 1/3 of the pulse pressure is mean arterial pressure let's solve one small problem here okay with the help of an example then you know exactly if this question is asked again every student can handle this let's see here if a persons okay if a persons systolic blood pressure is 130 mm of mercury here mm of mercury This is systolic blood pressure, SBP. 
and if diastolic blood pressure diastolic blood pressure is okay 80 millimeter of mercury can you calculate mean arterial pressure for this person now all of you please do it 50 so what is mean arterial pressure of this person with the help of that formula please do it sir it is 96.6 96.6 okay okay good any other any other student please utilize a bit of time okay use that formula and do this we have enough time there is no hurry Ninety-six point six six. So he's also getting the same. Good. That means that is ninety-six point six six. Very good. Now the formula is right there in front of you. So see there. So let me do it. Okay. Uh, mean arterial pressure is diastolic blood pressure one third of pulse pressure. So diastolic blood pressure is eighty here. So before that, I should calculate what is the pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is systolic minus diastolic. So it is 50. One third of the 50. You need to calculate that. Okay. Divide 50 by 3. It is somewhat 16. 16 point something. You add 80 with that 16 point something. It will be 96 point something. The student got 0.66, right? So that is the answer. Excellent. So similarly, in different exam. This type of questions can be easily asked to you. Even can be asked in MCQ question. Quickly remember this formula, calculate it, and choose the correct answer. This is called driving pressure for the blood flow. Let's move on now. now so with this concept, let's classify shock. Now, shock is classified into different types according to which of those factors are abnormal which we just listed so this is one of the very very commonly used classification for the shock different textbook has classified shock differently okay so whatever classification you mention that would be correct in the exam i never you know uh, tell my students just follow what i am teaching them it is their liberty actually they can follow some textbook and they can always write like that in the exam. So the main thing here is you should develop the concept. Don't mug it up, you know. Develop the concept so that you will never forget it. That's the important thing. Now see here, this is one of the very common classification. The three major types of shock are hypovolemic shock, the commonest type of shock, distributive shock, and it includes three main type of shock under the same heading which are septic shock anaphylactic shock and neurogenic shock all of these are called distributive shock i'll talk about that and cardiogenic shock so these are the three major types of classification hypovolemic shock distributive shock and cardiogenic shock now what do you mean by distributive that question must be coming in your mind so distributive shock means the blood volume okay inside those blood vessels is adequate or enough or sometimes even more than the normal but they are not i mean the blood is not present inside the arteries this blood is present towards the periphery okay towards the periphery especially in the vein or those arterial systems are dilated so bloods uh, blood is uh, collected there it is not present in the main arterial system and that can result in dis decreased tissue perfusion. So distributive shock is associated with vasodilation and the, and the types are septic shock, anaphylactic shock and neurogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is associated with heart problem. That's why the term cardiogenic. And hypovolemic is decreased blood volume. Now, before we move on to the topic, the first step in the treatment of any type of shock is control of airway and breathing. And next is restoration of circulation that is called A, B and C. Now, you may be wondering 
what is the connection of airway and breathing here we are talking about the circulation right now isn't it shock is all about circulation but i can give you few examples here quickly if a person has brought or was brought to the hospital as a result of road traffic accident rta or fall from a height the person was massively bleeding when you examine that person but if you forget to examine the airway and breathing and completely focus on only the control of bleeding there the person would die if the airway was compromised you are very happy yes i have stopped the bleeding okay and when you call the patient the patient is not answering the patient is already dead because you did not pay attention to the airway and breathing so all the time in very sick patient in emergency room quickly examine the airway make sure airway is normal make sure breathing is fine then only focus on circulation never forget this but if the patient is not sick you know if the patient is nice talking to you patient is sitting in front of you patient is walking around don't answer like this i'll examine a b and c that is not necessary this a b and c algorithm is important only in very sick cases or severe type of cases so before we move further let's you know talk about some of the very very important points once again think a b c with any patient in shock secure airway breathing and circulation now some of the students may want to know a bit more about how to secure the airway so right now let's talk about it now, i'll ask this question to you first how to secure airway anybody giving oxygen and ventilatory support okay fine any other some to sort of intubation so rather uh, like sir giving uh, the oxygen supply okay now listen okay this may be a bit difficult question because you have just moved on to the clinical phase so this question may be a bit difficult for you okay now see here airway can be secured by different means one of that is positioning of the patient positioning now this positioning can be done by okay lateral position for example pet don't place the patient supine position because when you put the patient on supine position then the tongue may fall back the tongue may fall back especially in a comatose case and that tongue itself will block the airway but if i put the patient on a lateral position okay the tongue will not fall backward the tongue will fall on the side and the airway can still be patent this is one of the easy way to secure the airway if there are some some foreign body quickly remove them okay if there are some vomitus quickly okay quickly suck it out and clean the oral cavity if something is there that is another important point so after positioning after positioning okay another is called et means indo tracheal tube intubation et tube intubation now this endotracheal tube intubation should be done if the person cannot protect his or her airway especially in comatose case and there are two types of endotracheal tube we have one is called cuffed tube okay another is called on cuff tube cuffed and on cuffed please uh, uh, mute yourself cuffed and uncuffed tube now to secure the airway we put cuff tube cuff means there is a balloon we inflate that balloon and after that nothing can go distally from that balloon part okay so this is a very good way of protecting the airway now the answering which you are giving to me is breathing now to secure a breathing okay make sure the person is breathing first the chest is rising that is important count the respiratory rate examine whether the patient is breathing or not if the patient is not breathing then you have to give artificial respiration okay that is bagging ambu bagging 
in the hospital and outside the hospital probably mouth to mouth breathing this is how we secure the breathing and oxygen is a part of breathing so we give oxy oxygen supply in case of breathing it is not in airway it comes in breathing circulation is examination of pulse examination of blood pressure okay capillary refill time all those things and maintain it by giving iv fluid so this is what uh, airway breathing and circulation management this is very important knowledge so from right in the beginning if you know about this it will be very easy for you that's what i was talking now let's move on now another is shock in trauma or post operative patient is assumed to be hypovolemic until proven otherwise because both of these uh, cases most probably occurred because of excessive bleeding trauma bleeding is very common in post operative patient as a result of injury to the tissues as a result of injuries to the blood vessel the patient may bleed excessively so we presume this as a hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock until proven otherwise now another important knowledge if the skin is warm when you examine it it is a distributive type of shock why in distributive shock the skin is warm what is the mechanism increase blood supply to the periphery very good because of dilation and increase of blood supply because of dilation make the increase blood supply very good so everybody is answering correctly this is because of vaso dilation okay there is good amount of blood flow still in the periphery so when we when we touch or examine the peripheral part like hands and feet they are still warm the skin is also warm all three types of distributive shock are having that type of thing septic shock neurogenic shock and anaphylactic shock on the other hand if the skin is cold and clammy okay cold and clammy clammy means sweaty okay sweaty type of skin it is hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock where the peripheral vasoconstriction occur remember this this vasoconstriction is the cause of cold skin and clammy is the activation of sympathetic nervous system and that sympathetic nervous system is causing sweating shock with bradycardia is neurogenic unless proven otherwise now we all know bradycardia is decrease heart rate less than 60 per minute bradycardia now what is the mechanism of bradycardia in neurogenic shock who can answer this Yes, sir. In the neurogenic shock, sir, the sympathetic system is blocked. But sir, the parasympathetic system it is overly stimulated, sir. So in the, this type, sir, I think the bradycardia, sir, is related to it. Exactly. I got the answer from him. Very good. Very well explained. Neurogenic shock is all about damage of sympathetic fibers, a sympathetic nervous system. And you all know what is the function of sympathetic nervous system in the heart? It is increasing the heart rate. On the other hand. parasympathetic nervous system or vagal tone is not affected so bradycardia is very common in neurogenic shock apart from that all other type of shock are having tachycardia in the beginning never forget this later on in a decompensated phase when the patient is about to die okay during that time the tachycardia may convert into bradycardia now that is a very very serious state and probably will lose the patient if that condition comes so for the practical purposes every student remember tachycardia is the feature of all other type of shock except neurogenic one now see this these are the important points for us so let's move further now please focus on this slide all of you now this is another classification which is mentioned in different books Okay, or by different author or by different teachers. Now, in this type of classification, obstructive shock has been added. Obstructive type of shock, but in some other, they say this obstructive shock is a type of cardiogenic shock itself. Okay, so there is a slight, uh, you know, a difference um, 
between the different author so we don't worry about this whatever answers you give in the exam will be correct so hypovolemic is lack of blood or fluid and hemorrhagic is the most common type especially in surgery but in in a medicine patient there are some other causes of hypovolemic shock like diarrhea and vomiting a severe type of diarrhea and vomiting very common cause burns is another important cause in surgical patient burns okay so we'll talk about that extensively in a topic of hypovolemic shock obstructive some type of obstruction occur in the uh, cardiovascular system now few of the important example which i like to mention immediately here anybody can can answer this the obstruction of aorta sir okay now see here okay this may be a bit a difficult question so let me explain this one is cardiac tamponade can also call it pericardial tamponade okay cardiac tamponade or pericardial tamponade means there is a collection of blood in the pericardial cavity which is giving compression to the heart so that there is a problem in the refilling phase a type of obstruction second okay is pulmonary embolism pulmonary embolism this is also considered a type of obstructive shock pulmonary embolism i am talking about the massive type of pulmonary embolism here which is known as shadow emboli third one is tension pneumothorax tension pneumothorax now what is pneumothorax what is pneumothorax accumulation of air leaks into the cavity sir pleural cavity very good very good i got the answers already excellent collection of a collection of free air in pleural cavity is called pneumothorax collection of free air in pleural cavity is called pneumothorax if that air is under a lot of pressure we call it tension pneumothorax tension means pressure there okay so this is a very very serious condition so we'll talk about that you know i'm just giving you important point right now so that the rest of the topic would be easier distributive shock students know it already there is inadequate distribution of the blood most of the blood is distributed towards the peripheral part as a result of vasodilation and neurogenic or vasogenic shock anaphylactic and septic are the type septic is because of infection anaphylaxis is because of allergic reaction it's type 1 hypersensitivity reaction okay and neurogenic is mainly because of the blockages or damage of sympathetic neurons now cardiogenic in this condition the heart is having some problem the heart is unable to supply adequate uh, you know perfusion to the tissue now give me some of the causes of cardiogenic shock what are those uh, conditions yes arrhythmia arrhythmia myocardial yes, ischemia myocardial infarction very good very good cardio trauma very good so so many answers are coming you remember any serious disease of the heart a perfect a perfect example you can give right in the beginning is myocardial infarction acute myocardial infarction and this is the very very common cause of cardiogenic shock these days especially the transmural type of infarction a big area in the left ventricle is damaged and that now that heart cannot pump the blood outside okay very very good cause another is arrhythmia absolutely cardiac arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation okay ventricular tachycardia and those type of conditions some other serious type of heart disease can also be taken as the example here like cardiac trauma like cardiomyopathy now there is a subtle difference between heart failure and cardiogenic shock heart failure is almost like cardiogenic shock 
but heart failure means the heart is still working okay but in a lesser amount than before the person can still still do regular type of work there are different grades of heart failure okay in grade 4 the person is very serious almost looks like cardiogenic shock in grade 4 but cardiogenic shock is a very severe condition where the blood pressure is very low along with most of the other signs and symptoms so if somebody asks you what is the difference between congestive cardiac failure or heart failure and cardiogenic shock uh, do not uh, do not get scared of this question the answer is very easy you can say heart failure or congestive cardiac failure is a minor type of cardiogenic shock whereas cardiogenic shock is a very serious condition where the heart cannot pump enough blood so that there is severe type of decreased tissue perfusion so these are some of the important or major types of shock let's move on now with this discussion let's let's start the discussion of hypovolemic shock okay hypovolemic shock is the most common type of shock in clinical practice so the name itself suggests there is decreased tissue perfusion secondary to rapid volume or blood loss so we are talking about hypovolemic shock this is the most common type of shock shock among all because of its causes in surgery the most important cause is bleeding or hemorrhage and that uh, bleeding or hemorrhage is caused by trauma or as a result of operation or surgery as well now let's move on to the topic this is decreased tissue perfusion secondary to rapid volume or blood loss and as a result of that volume or blood loss there will be decreased preload okay i'm sure you know the meaning of preload preload uh, okay let me ask this question what is preload yes the amount of blood which amount is going of blood ventricles have to the amount of blood contact uh, for that before the contraction it has to okay good the meaning is there the end of ventricular in the diastole so during diastole to be very precise sir. very good he is also talking the same way okay so many students have answer absolutely correctly though in a different way but the meaning is same so preload is called end diastolic volume and pressure end diastolic volume and pressure is called preload so whatever blood is collected at the end of filling phase or at the end of diastole is called preload so this preload directly depends on what is the blood volume okay what is the blood volume in that patient what is the venous return in the patient so this is called preload cardiac output is consequently decrease as a result of decrease in preload in case of hypovolemic shock this is a very very important feature as a result of this the tissue perfusion will be compromised the common causes include bleeding vomiting and diarrhea and third space loss this is called third spacing or third space loss okay uh, like in burns bowel obstruction and pancreatitis this third space loss may not be included you know as a result of burns burns may be included as a different a cause of fluid loss third space loss specifically means the fluid is still present inside our body but not in the proper place for example if there is a leakage of the fluid in the surrounding area okay or if there is a collection of fluid inside the lumen of the bowel or intestine what's the use of that fluid it has already come out of our blood vessel but it is not come out of the body so this type of thing is called third space loss pancreatitis is another good example for this in the bones okay usually there is evaporation of the fluid the fluid is directly lost outside so it is a bit of a different condition most common cause in case of surgical or trauma patient is hemorrhagic shock excessive hemorrhage or bleeding now all of you please focus here these are the causes of hypovolemic shock yeah if this question is asked any student can answer this quickly 
severe burns, excessive diarrhea and vomiting, excessive sweating as well, okay, excessive sweating as well. These are the important medical and surgical causes. Now add another important group there, excessive hemorrhage or bleeding from trauma, like road traffic accident, fall from a height, major bone fracture, isn't it? Or internal bleeding, don't forget about this. Like if a person has fall from a height, fifth story building, okay, that person may uh, rupture liver as well as spleen. Liver and spleen are highly vascular organ. So if they are ruptured, there is severe bleeding in the peritoneal cavity that can result in hypovolemic shock very easily. So all these are the causes. Now have a look here, please. Okay, just just focus here. These are the different causes of hypovolemic shock. So few more are written here. Some rare type of causes are also highlighted here. So hemorrhage, very very common cause, already talked about. Plasma loss through burns, already talked about. Okay, and decreased body fluid as a result of bleeding. Okay, vomiting or diarrhea already talked about. Some other causes may be diabetes insipidus. Now tell me, what is diabetes insipidus? Yes. Sir, it's also called diabetes, and it causes the imbalance of fluid in the body. Imbalance of fluid in the body. ADH. Sir, in diabetic insipidus, sir, there is excessive amount of urine formation. Okay, so let me let me answer this. Okay, you, very good. Some of the answers are correct here. So this is a bit of a very new term, probably for you. So let me explain this. Diabetes insipidus is associated with ADH. Okay, anti-diuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is released by posterior pituitary, but it is secreted from hypothalamus. So let's say it is coming from posterior pituitary. And the function of this is retention of water. The retention of water, especially from the collecting duct. If this ADH is decreased, that's what's happened in diabetes insipidus, then water cannot be retained in the body the water is excreted excessively in the urine, which leads to very diluted urine. Okay, very diluted type of urine. And because of this, we lose a lot of fluid as a in the urine, resulting in hypovolemia. So that's why diabetes insipidus is mentioned as one of the cause. You can easily mention diabetes mellitus here. Diabetes mellitus. Now, diabetes mellitus, everybody know, is a condition of hyperglycemia. Okay, because of decrease insulin, either absolutely decrease or relatively decrease. Now, in diabetes mellitus, because of the passage of glucose in the urine, that glucose will draw fluid along with it, and patient will be hypovolemic. So, both type of diabetes are the hypovolemic condition. Diabetes mellitus, very, very common disorder associated with insulin and diabetes insipidus associated with ADH. There are two forms of diabetes insipidus. One is called central, another is peripheral. So let me write that quickly here for you. Central and peripheral. Central diabetes insipidus is lack of ADH secretion and peripheral is resistance of that ADH on the renal tubules. So in both conditions, the result is the same. Okay, so let's move further. Let me... Okay, now see that another cause is a diuresis excessive diuresis for example you have given very powerful diuretic drug like loop diuretic 
for a longer time okay that can also result in decreased blood volume now how to make the diagnosis so it is very nicely mentioned here watch for increased systemic vascular resistance this occurs as a result of vasoconstriction which is very common in hypovolemic situation increase vascular resistance as a result of vasoconstriction there is poor skin turgor now skin turgor means skin elasticity now in a good okay or a normal people i should say which have good hydration status if i pull the skin mainly from the anterior abdominal wall that skin will quickly go back in no time within 1 to 2 second even lesser than that time the skin will go back but in case of severely dehydrated people if i do the same type of test it takes a longer time for the skin to go back this is called poor skin turgor or poor skin elasticity this is a very important feature of severe dehydration when we talk about the topic of dehydration i will mention it once again thirst important feature of dehydration again and dehydration occurs in hypovolemia or we can say as a result of severe diarrhea and vomiting dehydration occur and that can result in hypovolemic shock oliguria what is oliguria urine output less than normal urine good urine output is less than 500 very good so urine output okay less than normal in some of the textbook it is mentioned less than 500 ml in some of the textbook it is mentioned less than 400 ml in 24 hour okay you can follow any one of them no problem but the meaning is very less amount of urine output now that happens because of decrease renal perfusion in a case of hypovolemia there is decrease blood flow towards the kidney so decrease amount of urine production very easy type of concept low systemic and pulmonary preload very easy thing preload is decreased because fluid itself is low and there is rapid heart rate always present in case of hypovolemic condition the heart rate is faster and the volume of the pulse is low it is feeble or thready but the fast uh, rate is faster diagnosis is made after a loss of 15% intravascular volume probably before that all these clinical feature are not very common few of them will be there there no doubt but most of the clinical feature will come in case of severe fluid loss okay okay let's move on now with this let's talk again a bit about signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock so please focus here it's a very important class so i'll go quite slowly and explain every points which come on the way these are the common signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock early on the patients will have tachycardia okay early on the patient will have tachycardia every student know that now later on okay the person may also be hypotensive but those hypotensions are of different type early condition of hypotension is known as orthostatic hypotension now orthostatic hypotension means when we stand and if we become dizzy or if blood pressure is low only during standing we call it orthostatic hypotension this can be considered as one of the earlier feature of hypovolemic shock and the skin becomes cool as well as clammy cool always as, as well as clammy cool because of vasoconstriction clammy is because of sweating as the condition progresses the person become hypotensive now they have decreased pulse pressure they become confused and they have cold and clammy skin due to clamping down of peripheral vessels via increased sympathetic tone very nicely explained 
as a result of activation of sympathetic nervous system the vasoconstriction occur as well as there is sweating that is called cold and clammy periphery okay now see here okay so let let us discuss a little bit about this now why there is decreased pulse pressure so let me ask this question to some of the students why pulse pressure is decreased in hypovolemic shock who can because answer volume or decrease because volume, 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 volume decrease of volume of blood is of volume is volume pressure sir okay so students are saying because of decreased blood volume okay or decrease in a diastolic blood pressure now see here so let me explain this once again now pulse pressure is again let me remind you pulse pressure is the difference of systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure okay systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure now in this condition of hypovolemia the systolic blood pressure is already decreased because of decreased blood volume there is no doubt about it every student can answer this but diastolic blood pressure is relatively increase relatively increase as a result of vasoconstriction sympathetic nervous system is activated there is peripheral vasoconstriction so there is increased pressure for the heart to push the blood inside the blood vessels so diastolic blood pressure is maintained okay but systolic blood pressure is fallen so if we if you, you know consider these two points then the pulse pressure would be decreased it is not increased in a normal person what is the pulse pressure if i take example of 120 systolic and 80 diastolic what is the pulse pressure now 40 40 is it it's 40 so it if it is lesser than 40 that means it is a decreased pulse pressure if it is increased than 40 okay it is increased pulse pressure very easy type of meaning so if systolic blood pressure is decreased and diastolic blood pressure is still the same or slightly increased pulse pressure is definitely decreased which is one of the hallmark of hypovolemic shock if your teacher asks exactly explain like this you know there is no confusion now of the vital organ the first casualty of hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock both are called cold shock as a result of peripheral vasoconstriction are the kidney as blood is shunted away from the constricted renal arteries therefore it is crucial to monitor for renal failure and adequate urine output is one of the crucial sign that the treatment is adequate though it is very easy to understand okay still i like to highlight this a bit now kidney is not considered a vital organ here please don't take like that okay kidney is one of the very important organ but not the vital organ because vital organs means even if there is very less amount of blood volume in our body some of the organs will be given preference to get that blood flow like brain heart and adrenal gland these three are really important vital organ even if no other organs is receiving blood brain is getting that heart is getting that and adrenal gland is getting that but kidney they don't get blood in a case of hypovolemic situation as a result of this kidneys will clamp down kidney failure will occur in the beginning it is pre renal failure if you do not reverse this in time then pre renal failure will be converted into intrinsic renal failure or acute tubular necrosis now because of this single important mechanism if the person is still passing good amount of urine we believe kidneys are not damaged kidney failure has not occurred that's why a history of decreased urine output has to be asked in the patient and when the patient is admitted in the hospital we should always collect 
how much urine the patient is passing, okay? And check whether there is urine oliguria or not. Now, okay, all of you, please focus on this slide. This is highly informative one. So I'll give a bit of time for you to, to look at this slide. All of you, please do that. And then we'll discuss. Okay, now see her. So we, we don't have a you know a bit of time to to waste like this, isn't it? So you people are focusing there. So let me explain. Meanwhile, these are the clinical picture of a patient in hypovolemic shock. Most of the things which we have uh, discussed till now, there's a quick revision in this slide. So there is altered mental status. Okay, in a in a case of shock. We are talking about hypovolemic shock for the time being, and this is because of decreased brain perfusion. So the person may be restlessness in the beginning. The person become restless or in the state of restlessness and disoriented. Okay. Later on, the person may be comatose if a brain function is severely hampered. Tachycardia is a very, very important feature of hypovolemia or hypovolemic shock. In the later stages of hypovolemic shock, there is hypotension. Every student know the definition or meaning of hypotension. Now, you all know hypotension is a decrease in blood pressure, but what is the limit? Decrease than how much is called hypotension? Yes? Systole systolic below 100, uh, systolic below 60. Okay. I want to hear some more answer, please. Adnan is saying system is systolic less than 100, diastolic less than 60. Any other? No, sir. Sir, 90 by 60, sir. Systolic 90 and diastolic 60, sir. Okay. Okay. So, Uzeri is saying systolic is 90, diastolic 60. Any other? Less than 90, not diastolic. Okay. Now, see here. So, Abbas has also answered. So, listen, we do not consider diastolic blood pressure in the definition of hypotension. Only systolic blood pressure is considered and that level is 90. Remember this, 90 is the lowest limit. If it is lesser than that, the definition of hypotension is fulfilled. Hypotension will be associated with some symptom and sign. If the person is dizzy, if there is tachycardia, if, if other signs are there like like uh, clammy peripheries, cold periphery, prolonged capillary fill time, dizzy person, disoriented person, all these along with decreased blood pressure or systolic blood pressure less than 90 is called hypotension. Never forget this. Now, there will be dyspnea. There is dyspnea as well. Dyspnea is difficulty to breathe. This occurs especially if the person is having hemorrhage or bleeding which results in anemia. Anemia leads to dyspnea. Very easy explanation. Cool and clammy skin due to blood loss as a result of uh, decreased blood flow there, number one, and number two, vasoconstriction, and number three, the clammy or you know sweaty type of palm or skin is as a result of sympathetic stimulation. Ongoing bleeding can be seen. Observe for how much urine the patient is passing. And that can be done by inserting Foley catheter. Now, Foley's catheter, okay, is a type of self-retaining catheter. When we insert that into the urinary bladder, there is a balloon, and we'll inflate that balloon, so it'll, we, it will remain in the place. Even if the patient wants to pull it out, it doesn't come because of the balloon there. This is called Foley's catheter. So when we look at the in a bag of the Foley's catheter, if we see a good amount of urine, we'll be very happy 
in this type of people. But if the urine output is less, then probably the person has already developed renal failure. And regarding the treatment, see here, two important type of therapy are shown. One is IV fluid replacement. This is the crystalloid in the beginning, like normal saline or lactated ringer. And if they you know, do not, you know, reverse all the hemodynamic, uh, you know, signs, then blood transfusion has to be done. Blood transfusion is very, very necessary in case of hemorrhage or hemorrhagic shock. So this is a very informative slide where clinical features, some of the pathogenesis, and even the treatments are highlighted. Now, in hypovolemic shock, if it is because of bleeding, what is the treatment in the beginning? Let me ask you that question once again. What is the treatment in the beginning if this is a hemorrhagic shock? A blood transfusion. Now, no, you don't call blood transfusion in the beginning. That's why I am asking this question. We don't give blood in yeah. the beginning. We always start with IV fluid. Okay? IV fluid or crystalloid. Crystalloids are started in the beginning even if this patient is bleeding. Normal saline or lactated ring are always in the beginning. You make sure blood is available. Now, how I know blood is available? From where we get blood? Yes, let me ask that question for you. From where we get blood? Who will give blood to us? It may also be available, sir, in blood group bank, and we also can get it from the donor. Okay, good. Good answer, Zulfikar. Very good. So remember, you will get this blood from the blood bank. But blood bank, okay, is not, you know, producing the blood, isn't it? It is just collecting the blood and storing it there. So we should always remember one thing. Once we utilize blood from the blood bank, if possible, we should replace it. Means there should be some donor who are willing to, to give the blood or donate the blood. Always very important practical point. And when we are giving IV fluid to the patient, during that time, take a bit of blood from the patient and send for blood grouping. What is the blood group of that patient? And then find out the donor, ask to the family member who wants to donate blood to this patient. If some friends are there, call them, okay? then try to find out the blood and then do cross matching. In the studies class also, I asked the same question, what do you mean by cross matching? So some of the students answered it very correctly. Cross matching is absolutely necessary before we transfuse blood, okay? Cross matching is done by RBC from the donor and plasma from the recipient. We, we mix this together. If there is no reaction, that means this blood is safe to transfuse. In case of crisis situation, where there are no donors, if O negative blood is available in the hospital or blood bank, that can also be given very safely. So all these are important points in case of treatment. Now, before we move further, let's classify the severity of hypovolemic shock. You see this? There are different uh, you know, types or classes or grades of hypovolemia or hypovolemic shock. It depends on how much fluid or how much blood the patient has lost. What is the percentage the patient has lost? The first among them is the compensated type. So here, this is compensated type. Here, the loss is less than 15% of the circulating blood volume. And in this condition, there is little or no clinical manifestation. That's why it is called compensated one. Though patient has lost fluid or blood, okay, patient is still managing it. It is still in the state of compensation. Class two means it is partially compensated now. So in this condition, 
the loss is already between 15 to 30 percent of the blood volume. Manifestations include mild tachycardia, tachypnea, anxiety, orthostatic hypotension, decreased pulse pressure, and oliguria. So all these are very familiar clinical features to you now. There is reduced splanchnic and renal blood flow as well. Splanchnic circulation means inside the abdominal cavity, okay, towards the intestine. That is called splanchnic circulation. That is also decreased, as well as there is decreased renal blood flow. That's why the person is having oliguria. Anxiety is because of activation of sympathetic nervous system. All other we already talked about. Now, class three is uncompensated one. Now, patient is getting more sick. In this condition, the loss is already between 30 to 40 percent of the blood volume. Okay, yes, this is a severe amount of loss. The person is having clear cut hypotension. The systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeter mercury now. Oliguria, okay, or even anuria, market tachycardia, and confusion because of cerebral hypoperfusion. And class four is a life threatening condition. In this, there is loss of more than 40% of the circulating blood volume. Now, one small question I want to ask you. How much blood is present inside us? How we know what is the blood volume of that particular patient? Anyone? Five liters, sir. Almost six liters. Five to six liters. Okay. Twelve percent there. So somebody is saying five to six liter. Okay. Or somebody is saying nearly five liter. But let me let me ask you again. If that patient is a baby, still that baby has a five liter of blood? No, sir. No, so, sir. Then how to answer? No, what is the what is the correct way? One twelfth of his body weight. Okay. Now see there. One of the very easy, that's why I'm asking this question, you know. So from today you don't forget it. So it is around roughly, okay? It is roughly around 8% of the body weight. 8% of body weight. Now, let's do one calculation quickly. If that person is 60 kg, if that person is 60 kg, how much blood the person is having? Can you tell me now? Four point eight. So my question is, 60 kg, 60 kg person, okay? And I'm asking, how much blood volume is there? Now, what is the answer, Adhan? Say it again. So, so say it again. 4.8 ml. 4.8 ml. ml. ML or liter? A liter. It, a has, liter. it has to be liter, liter, isn't it? ML ML means nothing, okay? ML is very less. So it has to yes. be liter, okay? Fine. So he, he got 4.8. What are the answers of other students? Is it correct here? Absolutely. Okay. So how exactly. how did so how did you calculate that? Okay. So let's let's find out then only if this type of question is asked, we can handle it next time. See here. So 60 kg, one kg is equivalent to one liter. One kg and one liter is the same weight. So 60 kg means 60 liter. Okay. 60 liter. So 8% of 60 liter is 4.8 liter or 4,800 ml, you can answer like this. So see there, it is not even five liter, okay? Almost five liter, you can say, just 200 ml less. So this is a standard weight we take always, whenever we talk about, you know, 60 kg is the standard weight we say. So five liter is the roughly the amount of blood we have in our system, but it depends what is the weight of the portion? 
and what is the age of the person it always differs so always remember like this then you can easily calculate now see that 40 percent blood loss uh, out of five liter so how much blood the person has already lost out of five liter 40 percent means how much the two, two, liter. Already lost. two liter isn't it two liter so if a person loses more than two liter of the fluid from the body then the person will have life threatening type of hypovolemia one more point i like to highlight here what is the rate of blood loss it also differ if there is a chronic type of blood loss then probably the person can compensate for that easily shock will not develop but if there is an acute type of blood loss then much of the sign and symptom may come even before this so that is another important point here so with this let's move on all of the above okay all of the above of features which are uh, mentioned there plus lethargy mental status change severe hypotension oliguria or anuria all these are features of hypovolemic shock and all of these you can easily uh, uh, give explanation now they need operative control of bleeding if bleeding is the cause of hypovolemic shock we need to control it now before i i uh, you know stop today's class this is the last part for today just focus on this uh, slide and there is again the similar uh, you know four stages are uh, mentioned and accordingly the different clinical features are also written here so let's quickly go through it in stage one when there is less than 15 percent of the of fluid loss heart rate okay see there just more than 60 so we can say still within the normal range respiratory rate within the normal range mental status is normal urine output is normal and there is a subjective feeling of thirst and slight amount of pallor only so it is very difficult to diagnose in this stage stage two when up to 30 percent of the fluid is lost now the person starts to develop tachycardia see this heart rate more than 100 is tachycardia tachypnea more than 20 mental status the person is still normal or a bit of anxious this is because of stimulation of sympathetic nervous system the person is anxious or still normal urine output okay is still maintained and the person is having pale skin clammy skin and cold skin as well as delayed capillary refill time now this delayed capillary refill time may be a new term for you okay so the meaning is when we press on our nail bed how quickly it will get refilled we need to we need to examine it and the normal duration is less than two seconds if it refills in less than two seconds this is normal in hypovolemia it is longer move further now after doing all those things let's talk about the treatment of hypovolemic shock this is the easiest of the question for the students now remember what is happening here we are having lack of fluid so let's give fluid to the patient and patient will be all right in the beginning we always use crystalloid we always use crystalloid in the beginning now uh, from the last classes we have been talking about this see here crystalloid now normal saline or lactated ringer are the crystalloid this normal saline is having 0.9 percent normal saline okay this is the point and in the beginning we need to give this fluid very rapidly rapid resuscitation and that is done by two large bore peripheral iv cannula so it is usually uh, you know put on both upper limb in the anti-cubital fossa so let me write that point for you these are the important practical information we have one important vein which is called median okay median cubital vein okay. median cubital vein in anti 
cubital fossa okay anticubital fossa this is the vein which is very commonly used for cannulation and we need to cannulate on both side left as well as right and give the fluid very fast the adequate resuscitation require 3 to 4 ml of fluid for each 1 ml of a blood loss this is another important point you need to understand please pay attention now let's talk about this if a person is bleeding okay if a person has bled already 1 liter of the blood if i want to resuscitate that person nicely i need to give three times more crystalloid okay that means 3 liter of the fluid has to be given if 1 liter of blood is lost the reason behind this is only one third of the crystalloid will stay in the intravascular compartment other will dissipate outside in the extravascular compartment okay only one third of the crystalloid will stay inside the intravascular compartment and that intravascular fluid should be raised in case of hypovolemic shock that's why we need to give almost 3 to 4 times the blood loss never forget this now let's talk about something more out of those two important types of crystalloid we have which one we give in the beginning okay in the beginning we can easily use normal saline there is no doubt about it but if a large amount of or large volume of normal saline is given the person may suffer from hyperchloremic acidosis now what do you mean by hyperchloremia anyone what do you mean by that increase in chlorine uh, chlorine concentration exactly very easy question right increase chloride or increase chlorine you call it chloride sodium chloride isn't it so chloride we are talking about so in normal saline okay <laughs> high high amount of chlorine please mute yourself high amount of chloride so that chloride okay will lead to metabolic acidosis and that is known as hyperchloremic acidosis so let me explain about this mechanism very quickly so the students want to know about it probably or see here now chloride okay chloride and bicarbonate okay chloride and bicarbonate these both are anions these are negatively charged ions these are called anions now these anions will compete with each other to maintain the okay negative okay concentration of ions in the fluid they always compete with each other so what what is the meaning here here in this case we are giving a lot of chloride from outside so this chloride will push the chloride will push bicarbonate okay inside the cells it will push bicarbonate into the cells now what will happen to the bicarbonate level in the blood now it will decrease it will cause decrease level of decrease level of bicarbonate and that is called metabolic acidosis now if you go back when you want to define metabolic acidosis okay metabolic acidosis is all about decrease level of bicarbonate so we are having decrease level of bicarbonate in the blood as a result of pushing of that bicarbonate into the cells because of excessive level of chloride this is called hyperchloremic acidosis so to avoid this situation a uh, uh, ringer lactate is the preferred choice than normal saline in case of large volume resuscitation now let's move further if the person has lost a lot of blood okay then you have to replace the blood but replacement of the blood is not that easy you need to make sure the blood is available and we need to do two things here one blood grouping of the patient right there in our hospital and second is called cross matching make sure the blood is ready there then only you can transfuse another important uh, you know treatment is treat the underlying cause 
for example if a spleen has ruptured if liver has ruptured and that has caused hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock you need to go for surgical correction probably splenectomy should be done okay and ligate those blood vessels which are bleeding this is such a important point if there is failure to respond to fluid resuscitation even after giving a large volume of fluid then you think about this person may be bleeding persistently from somewhere okay that's why our treatment is very ineffective we have done a good treatment here we have given good amount of fluid but why the patient is not improving probably this patient is continuously bleeding from somewhere so you find out from where it is happening and go for the emergent surgical procedure that is surgery you go for surgical management during that time okay surgical management now see there so it depends on the cause actually what is the cause of hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock so accordingly those surgery should be chosen okay so let's move further now all of you please have a look at this picture can anybody tell me what is this position what is the name of this position which is attained in this picture anybody spine position elevated legs spine position with elevated legs okay okay fine you have simply explain whatever you can see here very good okay anybody know the exact medical term for this position this is a bit of difficult question for you okay so let me let me answer this this is called head low position head low position and leg up position in the medical term we call it trendelenburg position trend de lenburg position now this trendelenburg position is all about head low okay leg high or feet high position this position is attained if somebody is a bit hypotensive and if they are complaining of orthostatic hypotension or this type of shock you know to to increase the blood flow towards the brain this position is advised for the patient okay they should lie uh, in this position uh, on the bed or on the ground or on the floor wherever it is possible trendelenburg is the was the you know person who described this position for the first time let's move on now we have come come towards the end of this uh, hypovolemic shock discussion okay some of the important points at the end tachycardia is the first symptom in hypovolemic shock so never ignore it this is one of the vital signs we always examine what is the rate of the pulse and what is the volume of the pulse in this case the volume is low and the rate is high but sometimes okay patient may not be having tachycardia so what are those condition now see here these are the factors which suppress the tachycardic response to hypovolemia like beta blocker use okay beta blocker tell me the examples of beta blocker quickly very good every students okay are answering it correctly this is a very favorite questions okay this is this is the way i i teach my students any any type of these classification comes i quickly ask you the example so that you remember it even if you some student cannot answer now remember these are the questions which will be loved by your teachers during the exam so propranolol okay atinolol acibutolol isn't it labutolol okay so all these are beta blockers beta blocker causes bradycardia so if beta blocker is consistently causing bradycardia in that case the tachycardic response will not be there athlete now athlete this is a very important uh, you know cause athlete uh, or athleticism is a cause of physiological bradycardia physiological because the muscle mass in their heart is hypertrophied 
they can maintain good stroke volume without raising the heart rate so they don't need enough heart rate for the ejection of same amount of blood that's why they are usually bradycardic so if these athletes suffer from shock probably the amount of tachycardia would not be there another one in case of spinal shock or in case of neurogenic shock or damage of the sympathetic neuron or spinal cord there would be bradycardia very easy to explain one more point never use dextrose containing solution for resuscitation probably i have already explained this in my last few classes also always use crystalloid dextrose containing fluid is not a crystalloid and this dextrose never stay inside the intravascular compartment it will quickly dissipate outside and enter into the cell but what we want in the hypovolemic shock treatment is whatever fluid we have given it should stay in the intravascular compartment that's why dextrose containing solution is not used for resuscitation now with this okay uh, we have completed the discussion of hypovolemic shock and let's enter into another big heading that is distributive shock now see here please pay attention regarding the meaning of distributive shock it's a family of shock condition or state that are caused by systemic vasodilation okay that's why it is called distributive shock there is a common feature in all three types of distributive shock and that is vasodilation in all of them now let me you know talk a bit of physiological points here this vasodilation is mainly you know uh, we, we mean the arteries as well as arterioles here because these arterioles are the type of blood vessel which maintain the peripheral resistance okay so in this case all types of blood vessels would be dilated as a result of this the peripheral resistance will fall that's why it is written severe decrease in systemic vascular resistance you need to uh, you know remember this short form here okay these are very important short form svr is systemic vascular resistance in some of the book it is also written as peripheral vascular resistance so these are synonym so don't get confused here now these are the different uh, types of distributive shock septic shock is the most common one neurogenic shock and anaphylactic shock and when you examine this patient when you feel the skin remember they have warm skin and this warm skin is because of vasodilation on the other hand in case of hypovolemic shock and cardiogenic shock when we feel the skin what is the temperature of the skin in these two types of shock yes low cold the temperature the skin will be cold due to vessel constriction exactly exactly okay you are absolutely right i'm sure 100% of the student know this point already in case of hypovolemic shock and cardiogenic shock the skin feels cold but in case of distributive shock it is usually warm this is all about vasoconstriction and vasodilation now please pay attention here look at this picture this picture will provide us a lot of important information so see here so this is about distributive shock okay in distributive shock what is the main point here the blood vessels dilate which cause relative hypovolemia and a reduction in systemic vascular resistance now you have to be very careful to understand this term relative hypovolemia actually the amount of blood which is present in distributive shock is not decrease if i count the total amount of fluid okay it is just like in the normal portion but it is not present in those area where we want means the the blood is maybe present inside the vein 
okay in the peripheral circulation we don't want our blood to be pulled there we want enough blood to be present inside the arterial system that's why it is known as a relative hypovolemia very important point and reduction in systemic vascular resistance is quite common in this situation now see that so with adequate fluid therapy the heart easily compensate by increasing rate and contractility although this might not be enough so you may, you may see this later on when we talk about the treatment even in distributive shock we give a lot of fluid for the patient and you may argue why why the patient need fluid because there is no loss of fluid from the body and the answer is the fluid is not present in those area where we want the fluid to be present that means inside the artery so if we fill the tank we believe some of the fluid may come into the artery and that will help the patient that's why fluid therapy is still very much you know used in the treatment of septic shock and other types of distributive shock as well if that distributive shock is not treated in time now what will happen now see there our blood vessels are dilated capillaries are also dilated and what happens when capillaries are dilated there is leakage of the fluid there is leakage of the fluid to extra vascular compartment it is also known as extracellular space which leads to hypovolemia further means it worsens the hypovolemia the relative hypovolemia was already there and this will lead to real hypovolemia now okay so the person will become edematous this edema may occur in most area of the body and two organs are the most important during this regard one is brain another is lung in brain it leads to cerebral edema in lung it leads to pulmonary edema both of them are such a serious condition they can kill the patient so what i am saying here in the beginning of distributive shock okay there is warm periphery as a result of vasodilation but if that persisting for a longer time the person will start to lose the fluid outside the blood vessel and the person will develop hypovolemic type of shock and that can cause a lot of problem and then the skin temperature will also become low once the hypovolemic shock takes over the same patient who was having warm periphery in the beginning may develop cold uh, periphery later on and this is the mechanism now with this information let's talk about sepsis and septic shock which is one of the major uh, part of uh, to, uh, this class so septic shock is caused by infection we all know that it is caused by infection see that infection that causes vessels to dilate and leak causing hypotension which may be refractory to fluid resuscitation uh, this is one of the important point of septic shock Now, every student know what is infection isn't it so what is infection let me ask that question once again what do you mean by infection yes so, so infection is the invasion and replication of microorganisms such as bacteria and virus parasites etc okay yeah you, you are right it's very easy question okay don't get uh, you know nervous if this type of easy question is asked to you whenever microorganism enters into our body and they multiply okay that condition is known as infection very easy easy type of you know concept but later on we'll add something more there okay i don't want to make you confused right now okay we want to add something more later on in this class but if somebody asks you and you answer like this your answer is absolutely correct and those different types of microorganisms are bacteria viruses fungi and parasite refractory refractory means very difficult to manage medically we have given a lot of fluid 
but sometimes that free resuscitation may not be enough for the blood pressure to come up. That is the meaning. Now, regarding the lab and physical finding of septic shock patient, okay, there may be fever because it is usually caused by infection. So, fever is there. Fever is commonly present in the patient. Tachypnea means faster breathing, okay, increased respiratory rate. The skin is warm. And if we palpate the pulses, they are full and bounding pulse. Full and bounding pulse means high volume pulse. This is again because of vasodilation. Okay, so very easy explanation. And the urine output is still normal. Now, why it is a normal urine output? Because renal perfusion is still maintained. Okay, but don't uh, you know depend on this point later on when. Uh, there is extensive capillary leakage occur. There is edema everywhere in the body. And during that time, because of hypovolemic status, the urine output may be decreased. And that is a bit late okay, in the time frame. Now, later, what will happen to the patient now? Okay, The delayed physical examination findings include vasoconstriction. That's what I am talking right now. This vasoconstriction is because of hypovolemic situation. There is poor urine output now because of decreased renal perfusion. And because of decreased cerebral perfusion, there is mental status change also. That means the person becomes drowsy or even develop coma. When we take blood pressure, there is hypotension. Hypotension means systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeter of mercury in adult. Now, this is septic shock we are talking about. So, if we take blood culture, okay, if we take blood culture, there is chance of positive blood culture. There is a chance. It may not come in every patient. Please remember that. There are so many practical points involved with the positivity of blood culture. Maybe negative about 50% of the time, particularly if the blood is drawn after antibiotics are started and many of the time this happens because patient probably might have started antibiotics before coming to you these days everybody do that okay in our countries especially we can easily buy antibiotics without the prescription of the doctor so if we develop fever what do we think oh probably we need to take that drug to control the fever or infection and we easily take antibiotics. If it, if it doesn't make the patient better, then the patient will go to the doctor. Now, that time, those antibiotics have already partially killed the microorganism. So, there is high chance of negative blood culture. Having said that, okay, you still take blood culture in this type of patient as well. Though it will come negative, okay, but you still have to send it. This is a special protocol. Now, see there. Before the topic of shock, we talk about okay, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And I'm sure you still remember something from that topic. Now, see there. Okay, please pay attention here. This is the continuum we have talked during that class also. In the beginning, there is SERS. This is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And this SERS okay, occurs there as a result of infection and inflammation. Okay? Infection and inflammation leads to SERS. Systemic inflammatory response syndrome. That will further progress into sepsis. Sepsis will further progress into severe sepsis. And ultimately, the most severe of them all is the septic shock. So septic shock, if not treated in time, will kill the patient. See there, these milder manifestations of infections are classified as systemic inflammatory response syndrome, sepsis and severe sepsis, which is better explained in the next slide. So uh, you pay attention in these two slides, okay? Then it will be very clear to you. Now see here. So there is infection. 
okay infection can lead to sepsis so see there and uh, there is a release of endotoxin endotoxins are also known as lipopolysaccharide they are mainly okay uh, they are released by gram negative organisms so there is a complement activation here and uh, there is macrophage activation also because of the infection quite easy to understand these are the different example of cytokine tumor necrosis factor interleukin 1 and interleukin 6 now what is their you know uh, response in the body there is activation of the neutrophil there is up regulation of endothelial cell endothelial cells are present on the on the surface of capillaries or blood vessels so because of this neutrophil activation there is release of bradykinin bradykinin is very powerful vasodilator it will dilate the capillary and it results in capillary leakage okay capillary leakage now this capillary leakage leads to edema as well as hypovolemia because after capillary leakage what will happen now there is extensive edema everywhere so the amount of fluid will be less inside the blood vessel there is activation of coagulation cascade now this is called dic remember that this is a part of dic disseminated intravascular coagulation so there will be microthrombus formation and ischemia very easy to understand there is arachidonic acid metabolite formation also Arach arachidonic acid metabolite formation and one of the uh, you know metabolite is prostaglandin every student know that leukotrienes and prostaglandins are the major uh, types of metabolite so vasodilation is the usual result there nitric oxide also cause vasodilation and oxygen radical they lead to tissue destruction so all of these will combine together to form organ injury in case of septic shock this is called multi organ dysfunction syndrome let's move further now uh, uh before we go to the break okay let's uh, you know talk about this this is just a revision we have already done this before that's what i told you a little while earlier infection is when the microorganism will enter into our body and damage our tissue that is called infection so this is identifiable source of microbial insult source systemic inflammatory response syndrome means if these criteria are present in the patient any two of them okay if all of them are present is wonderful but any two of them would be sufficient for the diagnosis of sers and these are fever which is more than or equal to 38 degree or hypothermia equal or less than 36 degree as well so this is temperature here is the heart rate equal or more than 90 beats per minute respiratory rate equal or more than 20 breath per minute or partial pressure of carbon dioxide equal or less than 32 mm of mercury or if the patient is under mechanical ventilation now let me explain the relation of excessive breath rate and pacio2 now when the person is breathing very fast there is wash out of carbon dioxide that's why the level of carbon dioxide will fall this is the meaning and white blood cell count if it is equal or more than 12000 per microliter or equal or less than 4000 per microliter this is leukocytosis here is leukopenia both comes under sers criteria or if there is more than 10% of the band forms this is also very suggestive so any two of them will meet the criteria now sepsis means identifiable source of infection with sers this is sepsis severe sepsis sepsis with organ dysfunction like brain heart liver kidney okay and septic shock is the most serious among them all this is severe sepsis with cardiovascular collapse that means hypotension hypotension and we need to use some vasopressor medicine to bring the nice so we're talking about a septic shock and these are the 
a different uh, stages. See there, in the beginning, when the infections or microorganism enters into the body, there will be systemic inflammatory response syndrome that can be diagnosed by different criteria. We just now talked about that. That SERS will you know, progress into the sepsis if it is not handled in time. So sepsis means SERS with infection. When the microorganisms continue to multiply, they develop severe sepsis. And in severe sepsis, there is end organ damage now, multiple organ would dysfunction. And ultimately, the most severe uh, you know, stage will be reached, that is septic shock, which is highlighted by hypotension. So these uh, go one after other if the condition is not tackled in time. What is the treatment then? Okay, what type of treatment we do for septic shock? Okay, now see here. Septic shock is a medical emergency that requires prompt and efficient resuscitation. There's no doubt about it. This is a type of shock, and shock is considered a medical emergency in our field. Now, what does that mean? I need to quickly respond to the patient and do whatever I can to bring that patient back towards the normal state. This is called emergency. And in shock, okay, it's a circulatory status, which is a problem here. So we give maybe IV fluid, a lot of IV fluid to the patient. We try to bring the blood pressure back towards the normal. If possible, patient should be admitted to ICU intensive care unit this is the most sophisticated place inside the hospital okay we, we provide advanced care to the patient in icu so if beds are available patients should be admitted to icu if beds are not available then they can be managed in the ward itself now the aims of the treatment in case of uh, septic shock are here improve the hemodynamic state the person may be in shock the person Okay, maybe in hypotension. So we need to give IV fluid. We need to use some medicine like vasopressor to bring blood pressure back to the normal. Second, restore tissue perfusion, thereby increase oxygen delivery to the tissue. Now that can be done again by increasing uh, the uh, pressure, isn't it? The blood pressure, if the blood pressure is increased, the blood pressure will drive the blood towards the tissue and there will be more oxygen delivery. Number one. Number two, if you believe patient is having a lot of hypoxia in the tissue level, provide oxygen. Give a good flow of oxygen to the patient. Combat the bacteria and cytokine. This is another aim. Now, this can be done with the help of antibacterial agent or antibiotic broad spectrum antibiotics are used here if we believe this is caused by bacterial infection okay sometimes even viral or fungal infection can also lead to septic shock so during that time we need to use appropriate medicine now to combat the cytokine the cytokines are responsible for all those effect ultimately remember that so these days some of the medicines can be tried uh, to combat or to fight, okay, for the effect of these cytokines. So let me write uh, some of the medicine name here. To combat the cytokine, we can go for IV, okay, IG. IV, IG. What is the full form of IV, IG? Anybody? Intravenous. Intravenous immunoglobulin. Very good immunoglobulin intravenous immunoglobulin this can be tried and another drug is called monoclonal antibody monoclonal antibody these are also very advanced uh, sophisticated type of medicines which which can specifically block uh, those cytokines like tumor necrosis factor interleukin mm -hmm. okay or interferon mm -hmm. and those type of things please do not talk and mute yourself now another one is eliminate the septic focus. If there is some source of infection in the body, we have to eliminate it. Like if there is an abscess somewhere and that abscess is acting like a source of infection, we have to do incision and drainage and remove the pus from there. Okay? So these are the different examples you can give. Okay? 
okay now let uh, let's move further now see there these are the aims which we are talking about and these are the treatment now fluid don't forget them they are the first thing to give even in septic shock along with antibiotic fluid and antibiotics as are given together now fluid how much fluid we give that is a important question and the fluid should be given in a liberal amount okay and some of the uh, doctor even suggest you give fluid up to three times okay three times means three boluses three boluses of the fluid now we all know what is bolus isn't it bolus is a good amount of drug drug or fluid which is pushed in the patient these are called bolus so three boluses can be given and one or each bolus is 20 ml per kg this is a bolus so up to 60 ml per kg of fluid can be easily given to the patient in case of septic shock if that much of fluid is not you know bringing the blood pressure back towards the normal then i need to probably think about colloid like blood or probably some vasopressor agent okay this is a very important point after fluid we use antibiotics these are broad spectrum antibiotics which should be used quite early and in the beginning they are used empirically the meaning of empirical use is till this time okay we don't know which organisms have caused the problem there because we have not uh, got the report of blood culture so we have to use our knowledge okay and then choose some broad spectrum antibiotic which may cover those organisms after the blood culture report comes back okay and if there is a growth of bacteria we go for antibiotic sensitivity test and accordingly we can change the antibiotic later on so that is the meaning of empirical therapy never forget this very important term in clinical medicine empirical therapy surgical drainage of abscess or focus of infection has to be done if there are any okay it will really help the patient if blood pressure is unresponsive to fluid use vasopressor classically norepinephrine or other types of vasopressor also can be used now which are those important types of vasopressor that can be used in the patient in this condition yes can you tell me some of the name epinephrine epinephrine norepinephrine good good Dop dopamine dobutamine dopamine and dobutamine excellent epinephrine norepinephrine is already written here okay dopamine so let me write it for you dopamine and dobutamine dopamine and dobutamine these are the some of the important drugs these are called vasopressor and they really help the in the help the patient because in this condition there is redistribution of the blood so they squeeze those blood vessels and bring that fluid back towards the arterial system we have to maintain glucose level this is called tight glycemic control maintain the blood glucose level between 80 to 150 okay this is a slightly higher blood sugar level but uh, you know blood sugar level is usually higher in this type of situation because this is a stressful condition to the body and during a stressful situation okay some of the hormones are released like catecholamine and glucocorticoids and the response to them is hyperglycemia tight glucose management has been shown to reduce mortality and morbidity in icu setting so we have to go for this this is the range for us there are certain poor prognostic sign in septic shock and they are dic and multiple organ failure if dic is already developed this patient will have poor prognosis means high chance of death and multiple organ failure like brain is dysfunction heart is dysfunction liver lung kidney there is high chance of death
Now, please pay attention here. This is an important point. Urine output has to be maintained properly. And if urine output is maintained, we know kidney is still not damaged or kidney is working well. And that is, okay, see here, 0.5 ml or cc per kg per hour. That is equivalent to 35 cc per hour for average 70 kg person. So this much urine output has to be maintained in the, in the patient. See this, 35 cc per hour for average 70 kg person. Let's say this is a 40, 40 cc. Let's make it easier for you. So if you multiply 40 with 24, okay? So it will be almost, you know, you can calculate this. That much urine is necessary, okay? For us to know that kidneys are functioning well. So multiply 35 cc by 24. And that much urine should be necessary in one day. The common gram-negative bacteria which can cause septic shock. Look at this name here. E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Proteus, Citrobacter, Enterobacter. You can give a lot of names here. Okay. So these are quite common uh, organisms which can lead to septic shock. Gram negative commonly causes septic shock more than gram positive one. But gram positive organisms can also lead to septic shock, like Staph aureus, okay, coagulase negative Staphylococci, and Enterococci. So these are some of the important ones uh, from the exam point of view. Among them, Staph aureus is the most important among all. Now, after managing the septic shock, let's talk about some other types of distributive shock. And they are anaphylactic and neurogenic shock. So let's talk about anaphylactic shock in the beginning. Anaphylactic shock is about systemic type 1 hypersensitivity reaction that is causing chemically mediated angioedema and increased vascular permeability which results in hypotension or airway compromise. Okay, so everything is included in one, one paragraph here. So let me elaborate these one after other. Anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock is type one hypersensitivity reaction. The most important point here. In this condition, there is release of, okay, histamine and bradykinin and later on, even prostaglandins and leukotrienes will come into the picture. But in the beginning, it is histamine and bradykinin as a very important factors. They will lead to extensive vasodilation everywhere. Okay? Even in the airway, they can lead to vasodilation. As a result of that, there is mucosal edema of the airway. Now, what happens if our larynx is edematous? What happens to the patient? If larynx is edematous, yes? Obstruction in the uh, airways. Very good. Obstruction. Dipsnia. Very good. Excellent. All of you are absolutely correct. There is obstruction to the airway, which can lead to dyspnea or difficulty in breathing. Okay. So angioedema is a special term, which means the edema is occurring in the deeper tissue, especially in the subcutaneous area. And if that edema occurs in our airway, then we are having difficulty to breathe. This is an important feature of anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis. At the same time, because of extensive vascular permeability, there is swelling or edema everywhere. And that can result in hypotension, okay, which is an important feature of anaphylactic shock. Remember, this is a type of distributive shock. So, Hypotension is very common here. Some of the saline physical findings in case of anaphylactic shock would be urticaria and angioedema. Now, urticaria, what is this? Now, let me explain. Urticaria is a type of rash, okay? It's a type of allergic rash which is present on the skin. This allergic rash is elevated from the skin surface. 
we can feel it we can feel it very easily and it is extremely itchy so it is edematous type of rash and it is extremely itchy on the patient and it is usually produced by allergic reaction again type 1 hypersensitivity reaction another is angioedema just now i explained to you here in this condition the edematous fluid is mainly collected in the subcutaneous area mainly in the airway and very very commonly around the lips also so let me give you one practical tips or hint if a person comes to you with allergy examine very carefully around the face examine the lips examine the eyelid okay and open the mouth examine the tongue whether they are swollen or not if they are swollen don't discharge this patient keep the patient under observation for at least 24 hour because the same patient may be having edema of the airway as well and edema of the airway can lead to breathing difficulty later on okay so observation in the hospital is absolutely necessary if you suspect angioedema please correct the spelling of angioedema here okay it's a n g i o angioedema so laryngeal edema is a very important part of anaphylaxis which can gives rise to difficulty in breathing and one typical type of noisy breathing that is called strider strider is a type of noisy breathing which will gives rise to difficulty to breathe wheezing now you want to know a bit of difference between these two strider occurs because of large airway obstruction and wheezing occurs because of small airway obstruction so if bronchioles are occluded or narrowed we we will suffer from wheeze it's a musical type of sound which is produced strider is a high pitch sound which is produced because of larger airway obstruction like trachea like larynx or even upper part of the pharynx now see here these are the common symptoms of anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock hive okay hives now hive is a term actually okay we use for anybody know what is the another term for hive yes maybe you are rash on skin okay rash on the area good arctic areas okay so areas uh, so actually hive uh, you know is a term uh, we use for allergic rhinitis okay allergic rhinitis but that allergic rhinitis is very commonly associated with arctic area so you can use this for the both of those conditions okay. nobody will will say you are wrong there okay itching very important point itching it's a feature of histamine again wheezing or shortness of breath because of bronco constriction bronco constriction or edema of the airway occurs that will leads to narrowing of the airway which leads to shortness of breath uh, strider occurs if larger airways are occluded or obstructed and wheezing occurs if smaller airways are occluded or obstructed low blood pressure very very common finding because of distributive type of shock and the skin is pale color okay skin is pale color now i like to highlight a little bit more here in the beginning in the beginning this is a distributive shock remember that so there is vasodilation and the skin looks red in the beginning but later on if this condition persists longer there will be leakage of fluid from those blood vessels and that will turn this distributive shock into relative hypovolemic shock now after hypovolemic shock occurs the skin color will become pale you see that so this is a very nice correlation and if you understand like this you'll never forget whatever question will be asked to you you can handle them now this is a very good you know picture or a slide which is telling us so many important signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis 
so let's go one after other let's start from central nervous system light headedness now light headedness means the person feels okay the head is very very light it is a feature of decreased perfusion towards the brain it's a feature of hypotension okay or you can also call it's a feature of pre syncope or syncope also this is not a good condition to have any time the person may fall on the ground okay because of decreased perfusion loss of consciousness again a feature of decreased cerebral perfusion confusion is an important feature headache as well as anxiety these all are uh, all of them can be explained because of decreased cerebral perfusion there is swelling of the conjunctiva and swelling of the eye lid also okay these are the features of angioedema there is runny nose see there allergic rhinitis is a part of that so runny nose swelling of the lips tongue or throat this is a feature of angioedema a very serious feature who knows the same patient may be having problem in airway or the lung also let's come to the respiratory system there is shortness of breath or difficulty to breathe there is wheezes or strider there may be hoarseness of the voice now can you tell me hoarseness of the voice occurs in which situation sir due to compression of the left it may occur any recurrent laryngeal nerve okay good good yes yes so it may occur in hypothyroidism okay so zulfakar is also saying it's because of hypothyroidism okay good that answer is very good okay now listen here both of the answers are absolutely correct but right now we are talking about anaphylaxis so in this case if a person has hoarseness of the voice that means larynx is affected probably there is edema inside the larynx okay but you are right if recurrent laryngeal nerve is compressed or damaged there will be hoarseness of the voice and in case of hypothyroidism hoarseness is a very common feature as well there are so many other conditions where hoarseness occur if larynx is affected hoarseness of voice occur there is pain with swallowing also okay pain with swallowing but this is not a very important feature actually and this is not even the feature of respiratory system is associated with the pharyngeal problem probably and cough cough is a very common feature anything occurs in the airway cough is always there now what happens to the cardiovascular system now see here fast heart rate is there in the beginning and slow heart rate occurs in the decompensated stage never forget this in the beginning there is tachycardia if the same patient develops bradycardia this is a alarming feature that means this patient is going into decompensated phase and high chance of death now low blood pressure is a very important feature what happens to the skin now okay hives or those rashes itchiness and flushing important feature urticaria is a common feature of anaphylaxis okay pelvic pain probably because of decreased perfusion again gastrointestinal crampy abdominal pain diarrhea and vomiting this crampy abdominal pain is again because of edema of the gi tract or you can explain with uh, ischemia also and there is loss of bladder control again because of all these different reasons so these are the features of anaphylaxis in the short if i want to check some of the very very important signs and symptoms i'll never forget rashes on the skin okay low blood pressure and shortness of the breath along with wheeze or strider these are the four or five features if they are present in the patient we can easily diagnose this is a case of anaphylaxis now what is the treatment what type of treatment we provide uh, in this type of situation now let me remind once again this is a type of shock so iv fluid is very much necessary 
okay though it is not written there don't forget about the iv fluid if shock is already occurred but in case of anaphylaxis till now okay hypotension has not occurred so these are the important medicine epinephrine or adrenaline is known as drug of choice in case of anaphylaxis this epinephrine or adrenaline can be given by different route subcutaneous and intramuscular both route can be chosen subcutaneous as well as intramuscular but intravenous route is not that commonly employed okay in this type of situation why any answer sir due to uh, due to rapidly uses of drug uh, that's why we use subcutaneous because it increases the time of uh, availability okay good i agree with your answer okay there are uh, you know uh, one or two extra reasons in this situation if the person is already in shock you know it is probably difficult to find the vein the veins are collapsed in case of shock if if a very experienced nurse or the doctors are there and if the veins can be established in time we can give uh, epinephrine through the iv route but epinephrine is a very powerful drug okay even if a slight higher dose is going into the you know blood circulation which we give through the in, uh, intra you know venous route a lot of side effect would be there in the patient so to avoid this situation subcutaneous and intramuscular routes are better and irfan is right he said there is a slow absorption uh, which we want in this type of situation another is antihistamine Now, there are so many different types of antihistamine can you name some of the antihistamine drug yes diphenhydramine diphenhydramine loratadine cetrazine fexofenadine very good loratadine this loratadine exactly i'm sure cetrazine if i ask this exactly if i ask this question to every student turn by turn all of them can answer this okay very very easy question but never forget few of the example every one of you should remember all the time it is mainly divided into two categories one sedative and another non sedative sedative antihistamine and non sedative antihistamine now sedatives have okay a important role in this type of condition because this is a itchy situation so we want our patient to be sedated so that they don't feel that itchiness okay this is important point and if you if you are uh, for example a driver has got some allergic reaction or pilot has got allergic reaction or some of the student and the teacher got allergic reaction we cannot give sedative type of antihistamine when they are still working so all these are different practical points so you should be choosing the appropriate drug here so diphenhydramine okay dimenhydrinate phenyramine maleate okay and promethazine these are very commonly used sedative type of antihistamines and non sedatives okay, fexofenadine is very commonly used these days fexofenadine loratadine astimazole okay desloratadine even cetrizine cetrizine is a very low sedative type of antihistamine it depends according to the patient okay so these are the example very good so these are important drug in this condition another groups are steroid or corticosteroid we don't use them in the beginning but if these allergic reactions are not disappearing even after using antihistamine these are the reserve type of drugs for us now what are the common causes of anaphylaxis in the clinical practice you see that drugs like penicillin penicillin is a very notorious cause of anaphylactic reaction that's why before using penicillin you need to ask one question were you allergic to penicillin in the past or not never forget to ask this question and if the patient says doctor i don't know okay i cannot remember it is always better 
to check for sensitivity test before giving penicillin. It is important point. Radio contrast material like iodinated dye, insect bite like honeybee, fire ant, wasp bite, very important causes of anaphylaxis, and some of the food, especially protein rich flu food like shellfish, peanut butter, okay, even egg in some of the people. So these are the causes of anaphylaxis, the common causes. And remember, if you go to the pathogenesis of type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, it is mediated by IgE antibody. And these IgE antibodies are secreted by plasma cells, the same type of cells which forms antibody. Okay, so they are secreted by plasma cells. And after that, they go and fix on the surface of mast cell. This stage is called sensitization. And we need second exposure for anaphylactic reaction to occur. Now, the third type of distributic shock is neurogenic shock. Now, let's talk about it. In this case, there is central nervous system injury which cause disruption of the sympathetic nervous system. And whenever sympathetic nervous system is disrupted or damaged, there would be unopposed parasympathetic outflow. Vagus nerve is an example of parasympathetic outflow which results in vasodilation. You can also remember like this, whenever sympathetic nervous system is damaged, there would be vasodilation because the function of sympathetic nervous system is vasoconstriction. This shock is characterized by hypotension and bradycardia. Now, a very, very important point. Okay. Now, let me explain this once again so that you will never forget it. In all other type of shock, in the beginning, there is tachycardia. But in case of neurogenic shock, as a result of damage of those sympathetic neuron, and because of okay, unopposed parasympathetic or vagal tone, there would be bradycardia. This is the meaning. It occurs usually secondary to spinal cord injury of cervical or high thoracic region. Okay, cervical or high thoracic region. That's why the heart is not getting any sympathetic supply, okay? But parasympathetic supply is not disturbed. That's why the patient has chance of bradycardia. Now, all of you, please pay attention on this slide. This is a highly informative one. So let us explain this one after the other. Now, see here. Okay. Any factor that stimulates the parasympathetic activity or inhibit the sympathetic activity okay, can cause neurogenic shock. Any factor, the most common one is injury or damage of our central nervous system. Central nervous system means brain as well as spinal cord. Okay? So damage of both of those structures are the common causes. Now see there, some other causes apart from spinal cord injury, okay, above T5, this is T means thoracic, thoracic vertebra 5, is a spinal anesthesia, spinal anesthesia. Now what do you mean by that? Spinal anesthesia means you inject local anesthetic drug into the subarachnoid space, okay, just like you are doing lumbar puncture. You put a needle there and you push that local anesthetic drug into the subarachnoid space. This will anesthetize the nerves, whatever are present there. This is called spinal anesthesia. This can also anesthetize the sympathetic neuron. As a result of that, neurogenic shock may happen. Another one, vasomotor center depression, which can occur because of a severe pain because of some of the drugs, 
and hypoglycemia, which is a not a very common cause. Okay, not very common, but this is nevertheless one of the cause. Now, what happens here? Okay, please mute yourself. There are symptoms of neurogenic shock, along with hypertension in this case. Bradycardia is a very very common feature. So there is imbalance between sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation, resulting in massive vasodilation. Okay, vasodilation. Uh, that's why it is a distributive shock. This vasodilation causes decreased peripheral vascular resistance. Decrease peripheral vascular resistance. Okay, which will leads to decrease venous return, and which can lead to inadequate cardiac output. That inadequate cardiac output leads to decreased blood pressure. Decreased blood pressure leads to decreased tissue perfusion, and that is called shock. So this is how a neurogenic shock is causing a decreased peripheral perfusion in the patient. So let me quickly give you a few important points. Okay, from the neurogenic shock, one of the most important cause of this is spinal cord damage. Which which occurs because of trauma. Another important cause is spinal anesthesia or even general anesthesia. Very rare causes are some of the drugs or even hypoglycemia, which will block the vasomotor center. Vasomotor center is responsible for sympathetic neuron outflow. That's why this is mentioned here. Okay, and the important point is bradycardia and hypotension. Bradycardia and hypotension. now let's talk about the treatment of neurogenic shock now, neurogenic shock being a type of distributive shock the treatment is again iv fluid is to begin with we give adequate amount of iv fluids uh, so that patient usually respond to that means blood pressure will come back towards the normal if the iv fluids doesn't help then we need to take help of vasopressor the same uh, you know vasopressor substance which we have used in septic shock management like adrenaline or noradrenaline dopamine and dopamine the same similar type of drugs at the end a bit uh, summarize a part or summary of neurogenic shock the classical finding in a spinal shock which is uh, one of the cause of neurogenic shock is hypotension definitely bradycardia very very important point in all other types of shock probably there is tachycardia to begin with but in neurogenic shock there is bradycardia and there is absence of the rectal tone on digital rectal examination uh, that uh, really helps us in the diagnosis let's move further now another type of shock on our list is cardiogenic shock very important one cardiogenic shock Uh, results from pump failure means the heart has failed to contract properly resulting in decreased cardiac output you can clearly see it here okay now this can be caused by this can be caused by a myocardial infarction also known as heart attack in the layman term cardiac arrhythmia like ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation valvular heart diseases and cardiac contusion as a result of trauma from outside or maybe because of extra cardiac obstruction like pericardial tamponade pulmonary embolism and tension pneumothorax some of the author mention these as a obstructive shock and some other mention them as a part of cardiogenic shock so pericardial tamponade means collection of fluid under a lot of pressure inside the pericardial cavity which is giving compression to the heart pulmonary embolism shadow embolus okay is what they are talking here a big shadow embolus on the bifurcation of pulmonary artery which is blocking the blood flow towards the lung and tension pneumothorax is a, a pressure the air which is collected under pressure inside the pleural cavity tension pneumothorax in cardiogenic shock one of the very important finding is the wedge pressure this means this means the wedge pressure in the pulmonary capillary also known as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure 
is elevated. Now, you want to know what do we mean by this in a bit of detail. Now, this capillary wave pressure, okay, is, let me explain it here, pulmonary, okay, pulmonary capillary wave pressure. Uh, in some of the textbook, it is also mentioned as pulmonary artery wave pressure. It's a similar sort of things. It actually measures the pressure, okay, pressure of left atrium. It measures the pressure of left atrium. It is measured by a special type of catheter, which is known as Swan Gans catheter. Swan Gans catheter is inserted into the vein uh, that has, uh, you know, uh, that will reach into the left uh, atrium, and left ventricle, uh, through the pulmonary trunk. It will enter into the pulmonary artery, and then, uh, okay. Uh, we measure the pressure of left atrium. This is called pulmonary capillary wave pressure. This is elevated usually in cardiogenic shock. Another one is systemic vascular resistance. This is also elevated because of stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. Myocardial infarction is the most common cause of cardiogenic shock all over the world because it is very, very common. If you uh, recollect, Okay, or if you uh, remind yourself, uh, ischemic heart disease is the number one killer all over the world. So it is absolutely common, both in developing country as well as developed country. So it is also the number one cause of cardiogenic shock. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move further. Now, regarding the findings of cardiogenic shock, Patient will have cold and clammy skin from peripheral vasoconstriction as a result of a compensatory mechanism. And that compensatory mechanism is stimulation of a sympathetic nervous system. Let's see here, peripheral vasoconstriction. Additionally, they will have jugular venous distension or raised jugular venous pressure. They will suffer from dyspnea because of pulmonary edema. They will have bilateral basal crackles or crepitation, again because of pulmonary edema, and they have S3 or S4 gallop. This occurs because of left heart failure. So these are some of the additional findings which you have already studied from the medicine. If you, to check, if you take chest X-ray, it will show bilateral pulmonary congestion or bilateral pulmonary infiltration, like a bat wing appearance in case of pulmonary edema. Echocardiography is considered as a gold standard investigation in case of heart disease. The same uh, exists for uh, cardiogenic shock also. If we do that, it will demonstrate poorly contractile left ventricle, especially in case of myocardial infarction. There is okay, increased pulmonary capillary wave pressure, more than 20 millimeter mercury, and cardiac index becomes less than two. Now, usually cardiac index is uh, around three or four, okay, but definitely more than two. So cardiac index is decrease here. Cardiac index means, okay, so let me explain a little bit about this. This is a new concept for you. Cardiac index CI uh, equals to cardiac output, okay, cardiac output divided by body surface area, divided by body surface area. So body surface area is measured as a you know square meter, isn't it? So cardiac output liter uh, for, uh, divided by body surface area in meter square is uh, will give rise to cardiac index which will decrease in case of a cardiogenic shock. Let's move on. Now let's focus here. See here this will give us a very good uh, concept. Cardiogenic shock is the inability of the heart to maintain cardiac output necessary to meet the body needs. Extra strain on the heart causes decreased tissue perfusion, definitely. Okay, it is the extension of congestive cardiac failure. So much more serious condition than congestive cardiac failure. The common causes are systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, arrhythmia, 
and structural problem of the heart. So any serious disease of the heart can lead to heart failure as well as cardiogenic shock. Regarding the clinical symptom, tachycardia is very common, anxiety and delirium. Okay, anxiety is quite common in the patient. Increased preload, exact, uh, very easy to understand. There is a lot of collection of the blood inside the ventricle because of failure to pump. Pulmonary congestion as a result of back pressure development from the left side of the heart. Decreased cardiac output, again, because of inability of contraction. Dusky skin color because of poor perfusion. Decreased blood pressure, quite easy to understand. Narrow pulse pressure, okay. Narrow pulse pressure because of activation of uh, sympathetic nervous system. The diastolic pressure is slightly normal, normal or slightly elevated in comparison to systolic. So there will be narrow pulse pressure. Oliguria and dyspnea are quite common findings. Now, a similar type of you know concept will be provided by this uh, slide. See here, symptoms of cardiogenic shock. A bit of revision for you. Severe shortness of breath and rapid breathing, also known as tachypnea, tachycardia, alteration in the mental condition or status because of decreased cerebral blood flow, loss of consciousness level in severe type of cardiogenic shock, and weak or faint pulse because of decreased cardiac output. So these are classical point. Now, regarding the causes of cardiogenic shock, okay, we have already talked important ones already. So still, some of, some of them are highlighted here. Left ventricular infarction, a type of myocardial infarction on the left side of the heart. Right ventricular infarction on the right side now. Pulmonary embolism, see there. Cardiac tamponade or pericardial tamponade. Endocarditis of mitral valve. And left ventricular damage because of myocarditis and myocardial infarction we already talked about, even cardiac arrhythmia. So these are the common causes of cardiogenic shock in clinical practice. Now, some of the author we already talked about consider this pulmonary embolism as a type of obstructive shock. Also cardiac tamponade they consider as an obstructive shock. Now, how we treat a cardiogenic shock? Correct the electrolyte abnormality, most commonly hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. Okay, so these uh, further aggravate the condition of the heart. So we do that. Control the pain if it is a ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction. Morphine is a very important drug here. And fentanyl can be given to minimize anxiety, but morphine itself can do that as well. Antiarrhythmic. Cardiac pacing or cardioversion for pathological dysrhythmia or heart block management. So according to the findings there, we are going to treat. If it is a case of cardiac arrhythmia, you give antiarrhythmic drug. If the heart rate is very slow, you, you put artificial pacemaker or can be used cardioversion also in some types of arrhythmia. In acute myocardial infarction, you treat accordingly. Give oxygen, give aspirin, give nitroglycerin, give morphine, okay, uh, and then give other types of drugs. Sometimes we have to quickly take the patient for a cardiac catheterization and angioplasty also. Sometimes we have to give thrombolytic therapy as well and give uh, a, a lot of medicine. Now, what we do in cardiac contusion? Okay, cardiac contusion can be managed by infusion of inotropes, an intra-aortic balloon pump can provide temporary treatment. This intra-aortic balloon pump is a very effective treatment in cardiogenic shock. Okay, you will uh, study this in detail in medicine. Cardiac tamponade, we treat by pericardiosynthesis. You need to remove that fluid under pressure. It's usually, the fluid is a blood because of trauma. So remove that fluid and patient will be all right. Surgical exploration should be done if there is a wound on the surface of the heart. Massive pulmonary embolism is treated by anticoagulant like IV heparin. Okay, uses of recombinant TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, which is a thrombolytic agent. And if facilities are available, you can go for embolectomy as well. 
So these are some of the option. Now I already mentioned one additional type of shock, which is not mentioned by all author, but uh, you know mentioned by some of them, is obstructive type of shock. Now let's have a concept of it. Obstructive shock, okay. In in this type of shock, there is a reduction in preload due to mechanical obstruction of cardiac filling. So there is a real problem in a venous return and filling of the heart. Common causes of obstructive shock include cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and massive pulmonary embolism or even air embolism. These three are the most important causes. Pericardial or cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, which leads to mediastinal shift and kinking of the big blood vessels, and massive pulmonary emboli. In each of these cases, there is reduced filling of the left or right side of the heart leading to reduced preload and a fall in cardiac output. So this is a very important point. So let me underline this for you. So later on, you can realize this important point. In each of these, there is a reduced feeling of the left and or right side of the heart, which leads to reduced, okay, this important point, reduced preload, which results in fall in the cardiac output, resulting in shock. Let's move on. Now, let's focus on this table. These are the types of shock and their hemodynamic profile. Hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, neurogenic shock, and distributive shock. Okay, now distributive neurogenic shock is a, is a type of distributive shock actually. Why they have mentioned here, probably some of the findings are relatively different here. Distributive shock. Other, other types like septic shock and anaphylactic shock are uh, discussed under this heading in this table, okay? And they have kept neurogenic a bit different, but don't get confused. Neurogenic is a type of distributive shock itself. So this is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, cardiac output, and systemic vascular resistance. In hypovolemic shock, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is decreased. Cardiac output is decreased and systemic vascular resistance is increased. That's why there is vasoconstriction going on and cold and clammy periphery. In cardiogenic shock, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is increased because usually uh, there is increased uh, pressure in the left atrium. And that is measured by capillary wedge pressure in the pulmonary circulation. So it is increased usually. Cardiac output definitely decreases, and systemic vascular resistance is increased. In neurogenic shock, the capillary pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is reduced, cardiac output is reduced, and systemic vascular resistance is reduced. Everything is going downwards. Whereas in distributive shock, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure may be decreased or normal. Usually it is decreased. Cardiac output is increased. Okay, uh, that what happens in the you know early phases of septic shock. The cardiac output is increased but systemic vascular resistance is definitely decreased as a result of vasodilation. So these are uh, very important take home messages. Now have a look here. For the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock, we require ECG or EKG. We require echocardiography, chest X-ray, evaluation of cardiac enzyme, and arterial blood gas analysis as well. Along with that, CBC, Serum electrolyte are also helpful. Uh, these are done to rule out uh, which type of pathology are there in the heart and is car ischemic heart disease is present or not. Now, during the physical examination of a cardiogenic shock patient, okay, we may get tachycardia, right? Especially in pulmonary embolism and in any other types of uh, or causes of cardiogenic shock, tachycardia is very common. Other classical ECG finding in pulmonary embolism is S1, Q3, T3. That means here S wave in lead 1, Q wave and T wave inversion in lead 3. This is a classical finding of pulmonary embolism, so which will really help us in the diagnosis. Now, at last, let's summarize this big topic. Now, see there. Okay, I'll only highlight some of the important points and uh, you can revise this on your own later on. These are the different manifestations. 
heart rate okay what happens to the heart rate in each of the shock remember in all type of shock the heart rate is increased except neurogenic shock where it is decreased respiratory rate is tachypneic everywhere blood pressure falls everywhere in a established type of shock okay probably in the beginning it may not uh, fall but in the late stage of the shock it will definitely fall urine output decrease in most of the type okay decrease in most of the type in septic shock as a result of increased cardiac output in the beginning it may look normal or even increase later on in the established type of septic shock there is definitely decrease temperature see there in septic shock it is raised right in the beginning because many of the infection leads to septic shock but later on because of rapidity or rapidly you know progressive type of infection even hypothermia can happen so this is not a universal finding temperature within normal range in other type of shock in neurogenic because of the difficulty in temperature maintenance or balance okay a hypo or hyperthermia may be there regarding the skin a very important finding cool and pale in hypovolemic shock because of vasoconstriction okay vasoconstriction in anaphylactic shock the edematous in septic shock initially flushed but later on cool and pale and neurogenic shock it is definitely cool and pale so these are some of the important point and regarding the mental state restless and anxious restless and anxious in most of the uh, condition in neurogenic shock because of the severe brain damage the person may be unconscious so revise this table many times so very very important concept is provided here now okay this is another uh, you know uh, summarized part of this topic see that what happens to preload what happens to afterload what happens to cardiac contractility what happens to the oxygen delivery to the tissue okay what happens to systemic oxygen consumption and what is oxygen balance so you can go through these on your own okay think for a moment and then the answer would be quite easy and these are the different examples or causes of the shock look here hypovolemic shock hemorrhage burns and pancreatitis pancreatitis can lead to third space loss that's why it is associated with hypovolemic shock cardiogenic shock heart conditions like post mi myocardial infarction malignant dysrhythmia or arrhythmia acute myocarditis so or so many other different conditions can be included here obstructive shock tension pneumothorax cardiac tamponade and pulmonary embolism and distributive shock septic shock anaphylactic shock and neurogenic shock so these are a very very important uh, summarized part now at the end okay at the end please go through the, this uh, you know uh, slide or flow chart you can say see here uh, causes of hypovolemia causes of heart failure or damage to the heart and causes of distributive shock ultimately all the organs in our body would be affected by the shock this is called multi organ dysfunction and multiple organ failure which can lead to death and these are the in between processor mechanisms